Welcome to another edition of Red Meat. I'm Jim Garrity along with my colleague Mark Hemingway. We begin today's edition with a little bit of sad news, noting the passing of Father Richard John Newhouse. Uh, as you had said earlier, one of the uh, great uh, Catholic intellectuals of his time, a titan of the pro-life movement, writer, thinker. I never got a chance to meet him, but Mark, you said you did, so you wanted to share well, a little bit. Well, you know, it's kind of funny. Um, I, for those of you that follow the corner closely know that I am um, the, the token Lutheran here at National Review. Um, um, not that it's necessarily a Catholic magazine, but there certainly is a, a high percentage of Catholics on staff. Nah, nah. Uh, but, you know, interesting thing about uh, Richard John Newhouse is, is prior to him becoming a Catholic priest, he was a, uh, um, a uh, um, Lutheran pastor uh, of the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, which is my particular denomination. Um, so uh, I, I followed Newhouse's career um, uh, um, with, with, with interest, you know, as soon as I sort of became aware of him, because he comes at a very unique perspective and on a lot of issues for, for being a Catholic priest that, that I find interesting as a Lutheran. Um, but, but more than that, though, I mean, anybody that read the back section that he was famous for in First Things or, or, the, um, or any of his, his books knows that, I mean, he was just, I mean, a, a towering intellect and, I mean, just an unbelievable writer. Uh, um, there are a few people, uh, um, and, and Bill Buckley was one of them, Richard Juno, John Newhouse was another, that can write so much with such clarity and, and just literally like everything that comes out of their mind is, 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 is just... You know, the picture of, of, of you know, crystal clear uh, thought, and uh, Richard John Newhouse was one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't know him well. I met him briefly um, once, actually, last year um, when I was up uh, for New York uh, for a conference for, for um, young journalists, and I was there with my wife. And at the time, we had a six month daughter, and when we had a, um, we needed to find someone in New York to watch our daughter. And as it happens, a friend of ours, Ryan Anderson, at First Things, uh, um, uh, found a couple of young girls who worked at First Things uh, to watch our daughter. And uh, our daughter, actually, our six-month-old daughter, spent the day with Richard John Newhouse and uh, um, said Vespers with her. And uh, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was very sweet. Uh, and uh, um, Newhouse had something of a, of a reputation for being a, a curmudgeon, but uh, he was uh, wonderful with our daughter and uh, perfectly wonderful for us. And, and he was wonderful when we met him, and, and mm. he will be dearly missed. Yeah. Towering intellect, fascinating writer, very underrated babysitter. Uh, he'll be missed. Now, from uh, the death of a friend to the potential death of economic liberty in the Obama administration, uh, uh, if you've been reading The Corner, you know that uh, the appointment of Cass Sunstein to Obama's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs uh, spurring very disparate reactions. We've got some folks saying that, hey, he's the best uh, you know, conservatives could hope for of all the people who could be advising Obama. And then others are stockpiling uh, canned food and firearms in a bunker in Idaho <laughs> and expecting that this is just, you know, this is about as bad as it could have been. Uh, Mark, you're more familiar with them than I. What did you think? Well, it, it is interesting. Uh, I, I, I basically, I agree with all the criticisms and I agree with all of the uh, things that have been said in defense of casting from a conservative perspective. Um, earlier this year, of all people, uh, George Will wrote a very fawning column about uh, um, uh, Cass Sunstein uh, and his work. And uh, I think that there is a case to be made from a conservative perspective that Cass Sunstein is a good thing. Uh, his work, uh, where you know he, he talks specifically about this new economic concept of nudging, uh, is, um, is is very interesting. Um, for one thing, for someone who is you know basically a, a left of center economist to acknowledge that one you know the, the foundational conceit of his work is that behavior governs regulatory policy, I mean, is a huge conceit. Instead of, instead of the other way around. Instead yeah. of the other way around, yeah. It's a huge conceit for a, a, a liberal uh, economist and someone who is a major thought leader in liberal economic policy. So that is something I think that, that is, is, is a good sign. Hmm. All right. So, you know, and, and all things considered, this has not been the worst cabinet you could possibly no. imagine. Um, but, sorry, go ahead. I, well, but I was going to say, on the other hand, I, I think we can see that, you know, um, being nudged from all corners of our life mm. by government, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a big shove. You know, yeah. if you get nudged enough times, it can be a, a, a pretty uh, um, confining and, and, and horrible situation, too. I may prefer the Obamian nudge over the Clintonian grope. Um, <laughs> but moving on from, the, from one cabinet appointment to the next, I'm thinking of Leon Panetta, the mm. surprise choice, uh, allegedly going to be Obama's pick for CIA. I'm going over my CIA books, the George Tenet autobiography. Tim Weiner's fascinating history like, of the organization Legacy of Ashes. Um, my friend Hugh Hewitt is actually something of a supporter, thinks this isn't the worst possible choice. I'm going to take a quick moment to let everyone know that I'll be guest hosting the Hugh Hewitt Show next Wednesday evening, so check your local listings. But Hugh and I got into a bit of a disagreement over this. He's kind of a, a, you know, something of an optimist on this. I'm hoping Leon Panetta is ready for this. But man, oh man, you read Tenet's book. 
this is this is maybe the second toughest job in Washington. Um, not just you know there, there's constant uh, foreign travel and massaging other company other countries uh, intelligence agencies and making sure those partnerships are are what they ought to be. Uh, you're waking up at 5:45 to go over you know to, to the White House to to brief the president. I mean maybe it's, it's very possible Panetta won't be ready to do that for three months, six months, a year. Um, constant meetings and you know Tenet describes these things of being you know. Early in the morning, all the way through to the night, you're constantly answering. Everybody on Capitol Hill wants you know, your, their questions answered. Everybody else in the administration. Um, now, admittedly, when, when Tenet was doing it, it was one job. And now we split it into being CIA director and DNI. And Dennis Blair is generally getting uh, pretty good reviews as Obama's you know, reported appointment to that position. Um, but man, White House Chief of Staff just doesn't seem like the job that prepares you for this, to have zero uh, background in this. I mean, he last worked in the White House in 1997. Yeah. So theoretically, that security clearance is 11 years old. Lots happened in 11 years. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very nervous about this. Mark, reassure me. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I, I think that, that there is there's a case to be made here, and Obama's banking on this, that, that there's a real problem from, from within the CIA. And as such, that you know, the only possibility you have mm -hmm. of fixing things is to bring in someone who's a competent manager from uh, from outside that that hopefully has a skill set that overlaps enough with the C with, with what's required of the CIA to but at the same time doesn't you know isn't bound by any of the allegiances to the bureaucracy uh, from at, like someone who was promoted from within might be um, so I mean I understand the gamble on the other hand I understand what uh, you're saying as well and I, and I do think it's a big challenge in fact we were discussing this earlier in fact Jim uh, just informed me of a very interesting fact uh, in, the, uh, in, in the CIA's nearly 50-year history. There have been, what, 20 chairmen? 20 chairmen, seven of which lasted one year. And another four were about two years. So it, it's a high burnout position. We saw Porter Goss last barely a yeah. year. Um, I mean, all kinds of, each one of them has own, you know, unique issues of why they lasted that short time. But, um, you know, Leon Panetta is, look, we, the country laughed at the idea of a 72-year-old becoming president of the United States. All right, fine, we've settled that issue. As I said, maybe second toughest job in Washington. You have Leon Penna, 70 years old. Uh, that, this would be a tough job for a man half his age. Mm -hmm. I, I, I hope he rises to the occasion. I hope he's fantastic if he's confirmed. Uh, but you're just left with a little bit of nervousness. And the other thing I'm just going to, my, my lovely ominous thought to leave you all with before we close off today, this, uh, this week's edition. Um, if there's a terror attack on American soil under the, the watch of Leon Panetta, after having none under Tenet post 9-11, Porter Goss, even for that one year, you know, things were fine. Um, and Michael Hayden is generally getting pretty good reviews. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to keep uh, Gates at defense, it really seems kind of strange to feel the need to, to shake things up there. Um, if there is an attack and the perception is that some of these policy changes may have, you know, led to the circumstances that made that attack possible, it's going to make the 9-11 Commission look like a, a peaceful tea party that everyone got along with. There's going to be some serious recriminations. Right. Never, never mind uh, um, the election in 2012 has suddenly become uh, much more interesting. It would be a great time to republish Voting to Kill, now available to find remainder bins everywhere. <laughs> anyway, uh, so with these ominous, scary, terrifying thoughts and uh, thought of being nudged into oblivion and, you know, uh, this has been the grimmest edition of Red Meat, but hopefully next week things will be cheery. It'll be the inauguration edition. And uh, by the way, Mark and I are still looking for people to rent out our houses. Uh, I'll be watching the inauguration from a safe place four states away, uh, but his is right in D.C. So as long as you don't need to take any of the bridges that are all closed, uh, good location. Were you look, was it looking at a couple thousand a night? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all no, right. Uh, 10,000 a night, 12,000 a night, I believe is what the people are asking. Okay, look for his email here in the corner. It's a lovely, lovely location. And uh, we will see you next week in, I guess, the, the, the first post-Obama edition, or, or post, you know, the first edition in the Obama administration. For Red Meat, I'm Jim Garrity along with Mark Hemingway. Thanks very much for watching.